Okay, so first part of the build log then. We've got all the components we need. Cooler, thermal compound, CPU. We've got the memory over here in this little box from Amazon and the motherboard. We also have a power supply, just boring standard power supply used for testing. And this is important because you should always test the motherboards and CPU memory outside of the chassis before you install them. That way you don't wind up finishing the build, installing everything, and then discovering you've got a dodgy motherboard that was DOA. Okay, so now we get to setting everything up. The box itself makes a good safe workstation for putting bits on. So first thing, get everything out of the box. So, first thing we got the motherboard itself, obviously, and you have to be careful with static electricity. So, a uh, common good way of dumping any static electricity you've got on yourself is to touch a metal socket well, or a ground, you know, the, so the screws on sockets, because they're generally grounded into the back plate of the socket. Um, if you don't have a grounding wrist strap, um, I'd suggest that you make sure you always touch uh, metal components of the board. So like uh, the CPU socket frame, the metal bit of the frame you can see there, before you start handling the board fully, or maybe one of the screw holes to bring yourself and the board to the same static potential. Remember, static electricity will only do damage if it goes through the board to ground. So that's why you generally want to keep static down. So we can see the board here actually has its little screw holes there with bits of copper on them. Let's try and make it viewable. And that's to do with getting the screws to earth it properly to the chassis. It just prevents any static buildup. So we need to cut off these zip ties now. Okay, so I'm just going to cut here, go and get some cable cutters and be back shortly. Cable cutters acquired, we can now move on. So carefully cut the little zip ties holding the protective foam in place. Make sure you don't damage the board whilst you're doing that. It's best to cut near the foam away from the board itself. And then lift it up and carefully guide each zip tie out. You don't want it catching on anything and damaging it. Now we should be able to carefully lift the board out of its foam encasement. Right, get that out of the way. And you can now see where the heat sink point goes down. One pin there, one pin there, one pin there, and one pin there. If you've got a screw down heat sink, you're obviously going to have to put the back plate that comes with the unit on it. And that's this piece here. We're not using one of those heat sinks, so that's not an issue for us. And um, also at this point, it's worth looking where uh, the screw holes are for holding the board itself down. In this board, there's one here, one here, one here, and one here. There are none that are directly near the CPU cooler, so that makes life a lot easier for you. It also means that now we're going to have to clean the original thermal goop off the bottom of the CPU cooler because we're not going to be taking the cooler off again once it's been put on. If there'd been a screw hole near there that you'd needed to get at, then you obviously would have had to take it off when you install it in the chassis. Okay. 
So pretty much all thermal coolers that have uh, pre-applied thermal paste or pads will have a protective cover over them to stop that getting dirty. So you obviously have to take that off. As you can see with this one, they've actually got it set so that the clips that would hold it onto the motherboard are also actually holding the uh, cover on as well. So you have to make sure that they're loose, obviously, which they are, and then you can just pull the little pins through and you can see there's the thermal compound itself. Now this would appear to be actually thermal compound rather than a thermal pad so now we need to clean that off. So it's always good to work on top of something you don't mind throwing away so a bit of cardboard does the trick usually. And then you obviously need the cleaning materials. Arctic Silver do their own range. And you also need some cloth that isn't going to generate lots of little bits and particles all over the show. Right. Now we'll need to cut this big cloth up into smaller pieces. Um, and it's always important to do these things using scissors so you don't wind up with frayed edges which could release particles onto the cooler. So I'll just cut a piece up. I'll just put that there for the time being. Right, so it says what you need to do is you need to saturate the thermal pad or compound with several drops and then we have to wait for about a minute before we do anything. So this effectively has like an eyedropper in it so you just put several drops on the thermal compound Till it's actually covered in it, like that. Obviously it's important to keep these things level, so we'll just prop that corner up a little bit. Actually that's going to be not level either. Probably the CPU box would be a good levelling. Yeah, it is. So few more drops and then you have to leave it for about 30 seconds and then come back to it and start to wipe off the thermal compound. So I'll cut now and we'll come back when it's ready to be wiped off. So it's now had a couple of minutes and now we just have to start wiping off the thermal compound. As you can see it's coming off on the cloth. Obviously that's insufficient for removing all of it, so we're going to need a bit more cloth. And a little bit more thermal compound remover. Put a couple of drops of it in the centre. That's what dissolves the thermal compound, makes it more easy to remove. And you want to make sure that you've cleaned up really every last scrap 
of uh, thermal compound off of the main plate there, which is that flat, especially flat plate there at the top. As you can see, yeah, you still get little bits of it clinging on there, trying to remain. Like so, and that's what this is for. Once you've removed all the major gloop from the pad, you put this on there, um, and it says, you know, apply several drops of it to that, and then wipe clean which is what we're going to do now and what this does is it cleans that remaining set of little particles of thermal compound off and again we need another piece of cloth And you just keep polishing it clean, folding over the cloth, polishing it clean again until all the residue has been removed. Um, also, word of caution, you want to make sure that all of your cleaning compound itself has been removed as well, uh, because the thermal surface has to be absolutely clean, spotlessly clean, before you start applying thermal compound to it. So you don't want any of the thermal compound remover remaining on the job after you've finished. Right. Bit more of the surface purifier. And go over it again. Want to make absolutely sure that you've got a nice shiny clean surface with no residue of any sort on it. Because residue will really mess things up. This is also why they suggest using lint free cloths, so cloths that don't drop particles of their own all over the surface. And when you're finished, you should have a nice shiny surface like that, with no evidence of thermal compound still being on it. Let's get rid of those. Okay, so now we come on to the thermal compound. Um, some people say apply thermal compound to the CPU cooler itself. Uh, some say apply it to the CPU. There's not really any much difference in it, really. Um, you have to make sure that the amount you apply is reasonable for the chip you're using. Um, obviously you don't want it scourging all over the edge of the chip, but you don't want there to be so little of it that it's not going to make good thermal contact. So I'll cut now and we'll come back when I've put the when I'm putting the CPU in the main board and then applying this thermal compound to it. Okay, so now we come to installing the CPU in the motherboard itself. And to do this you have to remove the cover plate, obviously, and that's held down by this little frame here. You have to be very careful not to damage any of this because they are very delicate. And as it says there, 
this cap that's included must be put back if you RMA the board. So put it one side, keep it safe, don't throw it away. Then we have the little CPU here in its own box. And as it says in the instruction manual for the board, you have to make sure that you put it in the correct way around. And in this case, you can see they have their CPU has a little black line on it there and then two cutouts. Um, and you can see on this picture at the bottom here that the framework, which is this component here, is furthest away from the black line, which means the little cutouts there are closest to that. You will also see on the framework itself there, and you're, another thing, be careful not to touch any of those pins or you damage them, are the two little pips that help align the CPU. So, then you take the CPU and carefully and gently put it into position. It should just drop in without any struggle whatsoever. If you don't push it, whatever you do, it should just drop in without any force needed at all. If you're finding you need to press down on it, more likely than not, you either misseated the processor or you've got the wrong processor for the board. Um, it's also worth mentioning that you should always check the underside of the CPU for any dirt particles. I've already done that, but it's well worth doing. And also have a look at the motherboard itself for any bent pins in the socket because that can cause both the motherboard or the CPU to fail when you try and power it up. So once it's all properly seated and is actually down in its little, in its little frame there, you can put the cover back down over it and then press down on that to lock it into position. It will, without a shadow of a doubt, be stiff because it has to hold the CPU in place. But if you think you're experiencing too much resistance, for goodness sakes, stop, consult the manual and check again. Because the last thing you want to do is break the CPU. Now, I'm just going to cut the video here whilst I get this clamp down because I want to make absolutely certain that everything is properly aligned and I can't do that whilst I've got this under the camera here. So I'll cut now and I'll come back when the CPU is fully in place. Now the CPU is now properly seated and installed and I'm happy that I wasn't damaging it by pulling down the lever. Bear in mind you will get a little bit of creaking, that's just the way it goes. But next, uh, we have to apply the thermal compound to the can of the CPU. That's the metal bit at the top here. Um, and as Arctic Silver say, you know, make sure you've got rid of all the thermal compound. That means both any on the CPU die itself and on the cooler. And now here's a image of how you should apply the thermal compound and you can see those are the different options for how you apply it. Some chips have a smaller package, some have a thermal spreader already like built in at the factory stage. Um, this is how we're going to go for it. You want a line of cooler down the center of the CPU. Bearing in mind this is Arctic Silver 5. It is designed to be thermally conductive, not electrically conductive. So if a little tiny bit of it does manage to get round near the socket, it's not the end of the world. But it is worth trying to not get that situation in the first place. 
So we get a final look at the CPU itself. There we go. And it looks all properly suited. Next, unscrew the little cover off the end of the uh, thermal goop and then use the little syringe that it's in to run a line down the middle of the CPU. It doesn't matter if it's absolutely perfectly in the center, but it does help. Also, these tubes usually have enough for about six to 10 CPUs. So when you're done, seal them back up. You can use them again when you come to replace the heat sink, make a new machine, whatever. So next is the cooler. Again, make sure that no bits of dust or lint have got on it. Also, make sure that each of the clamps on the side here are in their inactive position. Uh, you'll obviously be pushing those up when you uh, put the thing in. Also, at this point, it's worth looking where the uh, CPU cooler header is on the board and trying to position the wire from your cooler as close to it as possible. That way you have a tidy cable run. Um, in this case, the motherboard has a CPU fan header over here on the other side of the memory. So we want the wire to come out either this side or that side of the CPU, here or here. So, then the next task is to line each of these up with their holes, like so. Then you have to pick the board up and carefully supporting the whole thing, push them in in a crosswise pattern. Now, obviously, they have to be in the lock position rather than their unlock position when you push them down. And they go tick tick when you plug them in, like that. Do the last one. Last one will always be the hardest to do. Also make sure that it is in its latching position, which is like that, because they have an arrow on them showing you which way to turn them to undo them. And they obviously won't latch if they're not in their latched position. So make sure they're turned away from their latch position, turn, you know, turn to their latching position and uh, pushed in properly. You can't overdo these, that's the important thing to remember. They're de fully designed to stop you doing that, but obviously don't force it, don't bend your motherboard. Okay, then the next task is to install the cooler header connection, which just goes on there. Once it's actually in the case, I'll tidy up this wire with a small zip tie to stop it from just flapping around and getting in the way. It'll probably sit well in this sort of location here so that it's out of the way of things. Okay. Okay, so the next phase of setting up the board and pretty much the last phase of the test process in terms of building the machine is installing the memory. So as I said before, we've got two 8 gig sticks of Kingston memory here, and we're going to install those into the system. Now, it's important to make sure that you line the notch in the memory just there up with a notch in the motherboard's memory tray, so it connects there. Now, um, some uh, 
memory slots like this have a captive end at one end, which means that you put the memory in at a slight angle. So that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, this is done to allow the memory connectors here at this end, memory tray connectors here at the end, to be right up against the I.O. ports. If you wanted these to be able to tilt like at this end, you'd have to have the whole thing longer, the whole board longer that way, which obviously wouldn't work out. Or alternately, as the manufacturer, you'd have to put the memory connections here at this end of the board. And since that's occupied on this machine by a different chipset, that obviously wouldn't be possible. Uh, being as this is a server type board, it has a remote management card in it. And that obviously takes up space on the board, leaving not a whole lot of space for the memory to go in. I'll just turn the board around so you can get a different view of it. And you have to make sure that it goes into its little slot at that end and is in that end as well. That end will still click when you push down on it. It does have a latch of its own, but the main latch is at the other end and that's what makes sure that it all stays in place. Make sure they're well seated, but obviously don't bend them. And as you can see, those memory units are pretty much the same height as the CPU cooler. So the lid of the machine will actually be about there. There will not be a lot of clearance between the top of this and the top of the chassis itself, because it's a one-year chassis. The next task will be to connect this up to a power supply, as I said earlier, and a monitor and see that it posts before we go and put this anywhere near the chassis it's going to go in. So I'll get ready for that and I'll just pause the video now and sort that out. Okay, so there I've got a monitor here, VJ wire into that and connected into the monitor. And we've also got the power supply here. And this is the 24 pin connector, and this is the little 4 pin connector. 4 pin connector goes in over here. Note these connectors are polarized, you can't put them in the wrong way around, it just won't let you. So, plug this one in over here, and it's quite obvious which way around that one's supposed to go, which is that way. So, we'll just Put that in now. Now it has to be sitting down properly all the way along, so that must be pushed right in so that all the connections are made. And then we'll connect up the little power supply. Worth making absolutely sure that all the vents are clear. So I do that, and then I can turn the power onto it, and you can see that the fan just moved a little tiny bit then. That's its initial state, that happens. Next we have to determine what pins need to be connected together to make it start up. And there's the system header, which is here, this little thing right here. And that has um, a pin missing at that end. You can see there's a key. 
and the power button ground and the power button are these two these two pins here those two right there so as this isn't in the chassis and isn't you know hasn't got a power button per se on it what you can do is you can connect those two pins together briefly to simulate a button being pressed um, you could use a little bit of wire uh, but you can be careful and use any bit of metal to connect together so what I'll do is I'll do that now and then we'll come back to the recording once the system is actually powered on. Okay, so as you can now see, the system is running. Um, and this is done, as I said, just by shorting those two pins together there. You obviously have to be very careful to only get those particular two pins and obviously refer to the manual to determine which ones to do. Uh, you probably see on the back there I've got network wiring because this thing has a remote management environment. Well, it's, it's, I can't remember which of these heat sinks covers it, but one of them does, uh, which is effectively a little system on a chip that provides a web interface for remotely managing the machine. So obviously I'm going to be making use of that, but in the time being we have monitor here, uh, which as you can see is showing the uh, BIOS screen. Um, I'll just move the camera so you can get a better view of that. Be careful not to disrupt the power wires though. Okay, so as you can see here, we have the BIOS screen um, and it's showing the CPU up the top there and the two 8 gig sticks of memory, which means it's recognised on the hardware level all the bits. And then you've got date and time down the bottom. They're going to be a bit off because. Yeah, this is the first time the board's been used. Then you've got things like CPU configuration, which has got a nice whole host of different options in it, which is really good. North bridge and south bridge options, obviously enable the south bridge handles things like LAN connectivity and power on. We've got it set to automatically power on here when it you know when power is restored. Um Storage configuration, you know, do you want smart enabled? Well, yes, we do. Um, what type of connections, you know, SATA, HCI, RAID, all that type of thing. They're all SATA connections. There are no IDs on this board, obviously. Um, serial port configs and SRL ports. Those are to do with serial outer management connections, uh, outer band management connections. Uh, different uh, alerts um, for like um, waking up the machine so on like keyboard events on PCI device power events um, even uh, ringing power uh, so uh, if you actually had things like uh, modems and that you could use those to wake it up um, RTC power on alarm you know, by operating system so the operating system can set it or enable and you manually configure it or disable it, whichever. And you've got USB control, WHEA support, whether you turn it on, this is to do with detecting errors in the hardware architecture, um, for Windows anyway. Uh, Intel platform service just shows uh, the management engine information and whether it's active or not. Uh, serial port, again, more to do with console redirection, things like that. The voltage control, obviously I'm not going to be touching this, but you can you know, help the CPU uh, overclock a bit. Although generally being a server board, you wouldn't want to be doing overclocking. You can also do a UEFI update by plugging in a USB stick and having it update off of that. Got the hardware monitor there, and you've got 
boots options like boot from LAN, which obviously is disabled because we're not going to be doing that. And um, then we also set uh, setup prompt timeout to 10 seconds, make it easy to get to, especially over remote management or on that laser. Um, boot, boot up norm lock is on. Full screen loader is disabled so you can see the post menu. Um, you get a few extra parameters there for like, do you want UFI, do you want legacy, etc. Or do you want to hybrid mode it, which you can. Um, you've got event logs, which you can view there. And you've got server management, so you can look at you know, like setting logs on that. You can also configure the network connections there. And those are the options for that. And you can also restore the configurations of the management console. Uh, there, if it gets all broken and whatnot, like corrupted firmware, etc. So that's that. And as I said, there is the web management interface. And this is what it looks like. So you can see like voltage statuses and you get a few different options across the top. These are fairly common across the majority of management systems. And you've got things like remote control, uh, server power control, and you can perform an ac action like you can uh, you can reset the server, you can power it off, power cycle it, whatever. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to save the changes on this thing, exit setup, but I'll show you it's actually doing its boot process now. Uh, you notice that the monitor goes off for quite a while. This is quite normal with servers uh, during boot. And then they come back up. And of course you've got that message there going to the setup, whatever you want to do. But you can say uh, power off server, orderly power down. So that does like um, a normal power down as if you push the button. Um, so I can say perform action and the whole system goes to sleep. Just like... I could power on the server as well. So it's fully powered itself down and once it's, once the little management chip has confirmed that it has gone to sleep fully then it will give you the option to power it back on. And of course you can refresh the page to speed things up. Obviously it's all password protected to keep people from meddling with it remotely. And so that's that. The next part of this build log will be to do with putting the actual machine in the chassis. And that will be the next part. So catch you then.